Hello and welcome into this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lav. We had a surprise winner at the Players' Championship who, at the beginning of the week, probably would not have been a surprise at all. Scotty Scheffler, the world number one, made six birdies and an eagle during a final round 64 to steal the fifth major here at TPC Sawgrass. Scotty's now won in back-to-back weeks, last week at Bay Hill, and now the Players' Championship. And at the Players, he's now won in back-to-back years, the first player, the first time, tournament history that has been done rex you are writing scotty tonight for mbcsports.com slash golf so what's your takeaway i have two lines in my laptop and one of them reads scotty scheffler is the friend we all want but few of us deserve i I, i'm going to and and go backwards somehow i i i'm taken by the idea you you said surprise winner and you kind of hit me off guard all of our favorites he was yeah, I'm sure he was one a view coming into the week. The defending champion one last week seemed to figure out his putting sublime ball striking all of the things that make Scotty Scheffler Scotty Scheffler. Of course, that all changed on Friday when he tweaked to did whatever it is to his neck. We asked him to explain exactly what that was. And in true Scotty Scheffler form, he could not. So I think what you end up with is a historic victory. The first time in 50 years, a half century of playing the players championship that a defending champion has successfully defended his title, and that guy did it, quote-unquote, slapping his ball around the last 54 (laughs) holes. It was an amazing performance. And even last night, I kind of had to talk myself into, and I think I said it twice last night, as we're going down the leaderboard. And I was like, well, no, Scotty Scheffler still has a chance. And I would always think real quick and be like, well, he's got to get a whole lot of help. He didn't get a whole lot of help. He got a little bit of help. But he did it all on his own. It was such an impressive performance. It was an impressive performance. He, Scotty Scheffler, I said he was a surprise winner, not because it was a surprise that Scotty Scheffler won a golf tournament. We know uh, after seeing him over the past two or three years, we He's should never good. be surprised if Scotty Scheffler wins a golf tournament. A surprise winner because his five-shot uh, deficit ending, entering the final round uh, matched the largest in tournament history. And you look at the big dogs who were ahead of him, whether it was Xander Schauffele, uh, whether it was Wyndham Clark, whether it was Brian Harmon. With the scoring that we saw, we saw Siwoo Kim have a low round. Uh, we saw Ludwig Oberg uh, have a good round and kind of burst into contention as well. You had to figure that one of those three players was going to shoot somewhere 50, you know, 65, 66, 67, which would have put uh, the eventual winning score out of reach for a player like Sky Shuffle. I think the surprise was that none of them did it. In fact, it was Brian Harmon who shot 68 and kind of uh, frittered away a couple shots late. Uh, who 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 had the lowest round of those three players, and so Scotty is is the one who is crowned the tournament champion here. And and I have to give Brandel Chambly a monsoon of credit, wow. as you like to say, Rex. On live from on Wednesday, uh, Brandel said that this uh, seems like the beginning of a dominant stretch for Scotty Scheffler. That Scotty checks every single box. Uh, he's one of the best drivers of the golf ball in the world, and obviously we know the, the, of the paramount importance that has. Uh, he's fantastic with his long irons. Uh, he, hits it, he hits it closer than anybody. Uh, he works diligently on his wedge game and has perfected that. Uh, he has arguably one of the best short games in all the world. And now, you know, six months into this project with putting guru Phil Kenyon uh, on the strength of the, of the putter change, uh, and now kind of oozing with confidence on the greens. Does not have to be perfect, uh, but has certainly proven to be proficient over these past two weeks that Brandel said it looks like Scotty Scheffler uh, is is going to be uh, beginning a dominant stretch here. We're, we're now two weeks into what feels like the Scotty Scheffler era. It, and it, it reminds me, Rex, that, let's see, eight days ago, eight days ago, I had a, a, a feature story ready to go with Scotty <laughs> Scheffler examining, in his own words, reflecting in his own words, on what was then a 51-week winless drought in official PJ Tour events, kind of the, <laughs> the 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 toll that all of the putting misses had put on his psyche, and yet we sit here eight days later, and it feels like the entire narrative has changed, and it feels like everyone else is playing for second place for the time being. I think we all want to read that story. What was it, 1,800 words? I think you said it was. It will live forever in my email outbox, a, a, close, a closely guarded secret between <laughs> myself and our editor, Mercer Bags. Uh, no, I think we all want to read it because I think it's a fascinating case study on how quickly he can turn it around. To your point, he finished 37th in the field and strokes game putting this week. I mean, we have made this argument time and time again. And now I go back. Just to the be idea. average. Just be average. Just And, I, you know, he picked up, you know, 0.4 strokes 
on the field for the for the uh, entire week. That's all he needs to do. And he was right back at number one strokes gain tee to green. So he did all the things that we expect him to do. I was taken by the idea that just two weeks ago, we were having this conversation about can he pull it together in time for the Masters? Is he going to be is is it going to reach a, a tipping point? where even as level-headed as he is, even as grounded as Scotty Scheffler is, it had to get aggravating at some point to go a year, a full year, have getting close week in and week out. I can't think of one instance when he didn't win. And it, it, we always have to point out, he did win the Hero World Challenge, an unofficial event. It seems like we kind of gloss over that one really, really easy. But I can only imagine how aggravating it was. And you never really got the sense. I'm sure deep down inside, he and his wife, Meredith, had a lot of conversations about how aggravating it was. I'm sure Randy Smith, the swing coach, got an earful. I'm sure Ted Scott got an earful. But it never kind of showed outwardly. I, I think that's the ultimate testament to trusting the process. It's the cliche that you and I as writers don't want to hear because you don't really write good stories with quotes well, like I'm trusting the process. But that's exactly what he did. And I don't think you saw him any higher today than we saw him low over the last 52 weeks. I mean, I don't I can't think of a point over the last 52 weeks when he walked away kicking his dog. I mean, it, it, that just didn't happen. And today, even when he came in, it was still it was more he was tired. It was more. The neck is probably going to hurt really, really bad in the morning. But, you know, right now I'm going to enjoy this. It, it You talk about his error, and he put it in context really, really well. He told a story tonight when he was in the media center where he was kind of asked a Tiger Woods-related question. And he said he was walking down Riv, and some guy in the crowd yelled out, Hey, Scotty, congratulations on being world number one. You only have 11 years to catch Tiger Woods. And hashtag, it, hashtag perspective. Hashtag perspective. It's a funny story, but it, I think it also speaks to the best part of Scotty Scheffler, that he has more perspective than probably anybody in the game. You can imagine how this guy could start to really feel himself. You can imagine how he's going to walk around now thinking that I did something that had never been done before. One that may, I did something Tiger Woods was never, never able to do, win back-to-back -back, back players' championships. I'm going to go into the Masters as the heavy favorite to win back-to-back -back Masters. I won Bay Hill. All of these things that Tiger Woods did, and I can't think on any level how I would compare him in to, to Tiger Woods at all. <laughs> I mean, just just by ball-striking excellence. From a from a personality standpoint, you, you really can't That's find it. two more disparate personalities. I mean, Scotty is so humble. He's so gracious. Uh, he, he clearly feels blessed and thankful to be in this position. I, I mean, he had to have used thankful a, a dozen times in, in describing describing the, the privilege it is to play on the PJ Tour, describing the privilege it is to be in the cauldron of, of final round pressure, the privilege it is to compete against guys like, like Wyndham and, and, and Xander, who are world-class golfers, the, how, how thankful he is to have the support uh, system he has, whether it's his agent, his caddy, uh, his wife, uh, his family, his siblings, so on and, and so forth. Uh, and so I, I think it's certainly refreshing to hear that. And, and like Brooks Kepka was one of the dominant players – of the of the previous generation or the previous kind of wave on the PJ tour, those two are, are I think they're they're alphas in in completely different ways, which I think is fascinating. And I think we talked about this last year when you and I sort of touched on the Netflix docu series, the first season. And I thought the best episode by far was that episode that had Scotty and Brooks because there was such a strike dichotomy. One of these guys joined Live Golf essentially at the time because he felt like he was washed. He was injured and he just needed to cash in a big check. The other guy was shown skipping down the street with his wife to go to get a cup of coffee. And that was going to be the highlight of his day. And you're like, Oh man, these two guys are on completely different planets. Like there's nothing that connects these two. And I think you could probably make that conversation about a lot of people. My guess is he celebrates this victory the same way he celebrated last Sunday after winning at Bay Hill. I think it was burgers and sparkling water. And then tomorrow yes. morning, he'll go get a cup of coffee with his wife and they'll have breakfast and then he'll go right back at it. That is about as American op apple pie as you can possibly get. It's also a little vanilla, to be honest with you. I mean, you sat through you and I both just listened to his press conference. And again, I started this with the idea that Scotty Scheffler is the friend we all want. but Very few of us deserve. And that's very, very true. Nothing that he said stood out. I mean, the one Tiger story from Riviera is the only thing that I even jotted down in my notes because, again, <laughs> God love him. Like, he's such a nice guy. Like, he's the guy you want to have living next door to you. But, man, he just doesn't say much. The, this is, to me, the perfect example of who Scotty Scheffler is. So you said that your favorite episode in season one of Full Swing 
was the dichotomy between Scotty Scheffler and Brooks Koepka. And Scotty Scheffler agreed to appear in season one of Full Swing. All you need to know about Scotty Scheffler is that he did not like the experience of having the cameras in his face following him for weeks and months on end and does not appear as a quote-unquote character in season two. He is, he is the best golfer on the planet. And he said, nah, this isn't really for me. The attention... I don't really like it. I just kind of want to go out living my life. I don't really care if I get uh, insanely wealthy uh, and and everyone knows me when I walk down the street. I think that's the perfect example of who Scotty Scheffler is. So to me, to me, Rex, though, beyond beyond all the things that you touched on and what this kind of victory represents at the Players' Championship, to me, this this really boiled down to his toughness. And I, I mean toughness in a couple different ways. I mean toughness in terms of the physical sense of he felt the, the neck twinge, uh, actually thought – that he may have to WD. He said he hit like a 56 degree wedge, uh, the 90 yards and, and, and felt a lot of pain and didn't know if he was gonna be able to take the club back. And as you said, kind of was, was slapping it around. I think there's a certain toughness too, you know, physically, not just with the neck injury, but, but also being in contention, uh, back to back weeks, the toll that it took, uh, on his, on his body as well. He said how difficult it is, uh, to play back to back weeks in the PG tour, particularly, uh, difficult tests like Bay Hill last week and TPC Sawgrass this week. But also keep in mind the, the toughness when it comes to, to Scotty Scheffler as he is insanely consistent. I mean, we have not seen this sort of week in, week out consistency basically uh, since, since Tiger, Tiger Woods since it, Tiger, you know, yeah. over the over the past 15 years. The, the toll and the burden that has to put on your mind and your emotions, how afraid you have to be after each and every tournament, knowing you have a chance to, to win – uh, rationalizing when you don't, celebrating when you do, moving forward, not getting complacent. I mean, there's a certain toughness and competitive and competitiveness that resides deep within Scotty Scheffler that I don't think he gets enough credit for. That I think you really have to admire if you're a golf fan. That, that the fact that that he puts himself in position over and over again and win or lose continues to do it. You know, he doesn't get beaten down, and yet he also doesn't get so high that there's like a, a natural letdown as well. Well, and I talked to Ted Scott, his caddy this afternoon, and, and we asked him, did it ever, did you ever have a conversation about WD? And, and Scott's response was, if it was me, I would have WD. His quote to me was, there's not enough drugs in the world for me to keep playing like that. So I think what the quotes you're going to read in my story and all the other stories tomorrow is it, from Scotty is going to downplay this very much. And I think that that's on brand for Scotty Scheffler. He, of course, he's going to downplay it. Of course, it was just, this happens in golf. It's what he told us yesterday when he finished up his third round, you know, everybody's dealing with something. He's not that kind of person that he's going to lean ever lean into this. However, when I asked Ted Scott, like how bad did it actually get? And he said at one point on Saturday, he told me it hurt to chip. So that tells you how much it hurt. And you also have, kind of have to factor in the idea that Slapping it around meant he had to use his hands a lot. Meant he wasn't hitting stock anything. There was no stock eight irons. There was no stock wedges. There was no stock anything. And Teddy said they were kind of having to have a conversation on every single shot where, okay, it's normally an eight iron, but are you feeling normal? And and Scotty would be honest. No, I'm not feeling normal. So they had to make adjustments. That all sounds pretty simple until you're actually in the heat of a competition. And under normal circumstances, it's really, really hard to win on the PGA Tour, it's especially when you start five shots back on TPC Scottsdale, chasing down those players he was chasing down. Wyndham Clark, who is playing as well as anyone not named Scotty Scheffler right now. Xander Schauffele, who seemed to find something very, very special in that new swing of his and his work with Chris Como. Brian Harmon, who seems like he was built in the laboratory to play this golf course. All of those things are hard enough to do. But now you're factoring in, my neck hurts. And every time I, I turn to the target, I lose my alignment because if I can't turn my head like I normally do, how do you turn your head? This is a visual audience thing. I apologize for those on the audio crowd, but you do that. And so he asked him how he asked Teddy how his alignment was. And he said, it's fine when you're over the ball, but then you look at the target and you go dead left. Like there was nothing normal. There was nothing mundane. There was nothing sort of stock about this victory. And I think that probably speaks more to Scotty's talent than anything he's done in the game. The Masters victory was unbelievable. Winning the players last year was unbelievable. His, his consistency is so impressive. But what he did this week was so out of the norm for someone that clearly doesn't like drama in his life, and he just ate it all and won. So Scotty Scheffler is your player's champion. But Rex, I think this player's might eventually go down as the one that had this frenetic final hour where three players 
had an opportunity not just to win, uh, but at least force a playoff, and yet none of them did it. In order, it was Brian Harmon who missed a 20-footer uh, on the 18th hole, and then it was Xander Schauffele who blew his tee shot just a little bit wide right after missing a, a six-footer uh, on 17 and was unable to uh, convert his birdie putt to tie an 18. And then painfully, most most painfully, it was Wyndham Clark with one of the most violent horseshoes you can possibly imagine. But in the autopsy of what will be this 2024 Players Championship, which of those three players do you think it hurts the most? Wyndham? Xander, who obviously had the 54-hole lead, or Brian Harmon, who will probably rue some of his chances over the last three holes. I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I did not. All of them. <laughs> well, no, all of them. It's really, really hard. No, but I'm going to cheat because I wasn't in on the Wyndham Clark scrum. You were. Uh, I was obviously – I'm writing Scotty, so I was out with that crowd. You walked out and you said – you've already told me that if, if you want to listen to something sad, if you want to see the true pain, the true cost, that losing a tournament that you feel like you should have won – Listen to Wyndham Clark's interview. That's what you told me. So I'm going to go with Wyndham. Uh, I, my guess is Xander probably is encouraged, if nothing else, because of the work that he's doing with Chris Como. You could tell all day long. I mean, even really all week long. He was kind of still not entirely comfortable with what they're trying to do. They're clearly heading in the right direction. They're on the right path based on how he played. But I think you take that as a baby step. You probably take that as encouragement. I, I think Brian Harmon would be 1B behind Wyndham when it comes to being hurt because it, it's funny. We talked about this last night. This is, this is his major championship and that's not fair because he's the, the guy he just, who, because the he guy, just won a major he, championship. He's the guy who most recently won a major championship <laughs> at the open. But if you're going to point to a major championship quote, and I'm using air quotes for that one, of course that sets up good for him. It's always going to be this one and not to, it's certainly not going to be Augusta national. Most of the U S open venues are out of the question and conditions are going to dictate if he can compete at, at the open championship and the PGA championship is probably out of his realm. So it's going to be this one because it doesn't favor a certain style of game. It allows him to do what he does best, which is plod and putt really, really well and just be the bulldog that he is. And he had opportunities is the part that kills you. I, he, he didn't have a great look on 17, but his approach shot on 18. I, I don't know how it stopped where it did. It was downwind. It kind of came in hot. It was off the pine straw. And it literally checked up on the front of the green, and he gave it a good run. So I would put him 1B right behind Wyndham. Wyndham seems like he was gutted. Yeah, Wyndham was gutted, and I will speak for a long time here as you position yourself to get a little bit lighter as now darkness is descending yeah. on TBC Sawgrass. This is a professional uh, courtesy to you to find a different position. But, yeah, I was in I was in the Wyndham Clark scrum, uh, and I, I asked him, uh, I thought most pointedly, I said, you know, obviously as golfers, you lose way more than you win in this sport. But the feeling that you have now walking off the 72nd hole, I imagine that's different than some of the other close calls that you had. And he, I thought he was really good in, in kind of going through the self-rationalization in the moment. And his sports psychologist, Julie Elion, uh, was, was, was just outside the flash area as well. Uh, and I'm sure she'll be she'll be weighing in here shortly uh, to, to to get Wyndham on the right track. But but Wyndham said, "Look, you 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 just got a bunch of FedEx Cup points. You're in a bunch of money, but it still sucks." And and Wyndham said that he he had dreamt about making a putt that that really mattered. You know, having the the fist bump. You could see how he was kind of stepping into that, like thinking he was about to deliver an emphatic fist bump, force a three hole aggregate playoff with world number one Scotty Scheffler. Uh, and so he was. He was he was he was bummed that he was robbed of having kind of that platform and that stage, which I thought was was pretty cool. But I mean, he was still he was still in a in a state of disbelief, and that's one of the that's one of the weird things about this job too, isn't it? Where they come off the seventy second hole, they go into scoring. Uh, it takes a, a minute or two to sign your scorecard, and then all of a sudden you're in front of microphones in front of of, of media who are probing you about what was either. Uh, something that was embarrassing, something that did not go your way, uh, some sort of mistake that you made. Uh, and so it's all uh, very critical uh, and, and very, um, I think, painful to go through some of those moments in, in real time like that. And I, that was that was among the most crushed that I've seen a professional golfer. Uh, but Russ, uh, our Alex Russell, uh, Golf Channel extraordinaire, how, how did you find it? 
Uh, well, uh, she can answer. And that was some really good gas bagging, by the way. I have now repositioned. I think I have a little bit more light on my face. We have called her out. We have give her, given her shout outs on many, many a podcast. But ladies and gentlemen, this is Alex Russell. Hello, everyone. Alex Russell, of course, is she is uh, the vice president of everything. There's the executive vice president of everything, Courtney Holt. We just want to give her a proper shout out because we have it this week. And she was very kind to us. She got us our crew gift. So thank you, Russ. You're welcome, guys. My favorite. What was your takeaway, Rex, from from Wyndham coming coming so close? This could have been his fourth victory uh, in his past 17 starts. I thought he played better than Xander from Tita Green. Uh, on Sunday, and I think the stats bear that out as well. Uh, but but for the first time in a long time, the putter dried up. I mean, you covered Pebble Beach. He had a he had a putt to shoot fifty nine at one of the most iconic courses uh, in the world. Had a four shot lead at the halfway point here. Uh, but I think it was a it was a final round to forget uh, on the greens, kind of encapsulated with that miss uh, on the seventy second hole as well. Uh, vice President, uh, Executive Vice President of everything, Courtney Holt, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you everything for your uh, help this week, Courtney. Thank you guys for everything. Best uh, podcast, best bot golf podcast anywhere. Uh, Courtney runs the golf channel, by the way. So that that's why she, we're having her on the podcast. We were told it's we're contractually obligated. Mandatory. As, okay. as we should be. Uh, I'll answer your question. I, I think it was surprising that he didn't putt well the last two days, given how well he played the first two days. He opens with 65-65. It seems like there's nothing that he's not doing well. Uh, I didn't see that coming because what we have seen over the last year, really since he won at Wells Fargo and, of course, followed that up at the U.S. Open, is if he's playing well, he there aren't any dips. Like he, Now, we have seen him struggle a little bit. Certainly, we saw him struggling before he won at Pebble Beach this year, and he kind of made some adjustments to his putting. Uh, but when he shows up and he has his game, he normally – shoot 65, 65, 67, 67, and wins by three strokes. So that one surprises me a little bit. It also surprises me because of the way he verbalized his respect, maybe is the way to put it, of Scotty Scheffler. He he put Scotty Scheffler where he probably should be, where he absolutely should be. He is the pendulum. He is aspirational right now. That That's what every golfer pr should probably want to do is be Scotty Scheffler as far as consistency goes, as far as not getting too high, as far as not getting too low. And to do that and then to put yourself in the position where you actually had to back up, like you didn't necessarily have to do anything special today. The one thing you couldn't do is what he did, which is essentially come out completely flat. That surprises me. As it relates to Xander Schauffele, this was still his tournament to win, Rex, with eight holes to play, regardless of what Scotty Scheffler was going to do, regardless of whether Scotty Scheffler shot 64. This was still Scottish, uh, this was still Xander Schauffele's tournament to win with eight holes to play. And that's where I think uh, Xander is going to be uh, kind of brewing the chances that he had. You, you look at the par five, he's in the middle of fairway on 11, flails it in the bunker, unable to get up and down. It makes par on what is a pretty easy par five. Uh, even though he did get up and down on 12, the back-to-back -back bogeys on, on 14 and 15. And this is how razor thin the margins are at TPC Sawgrass. You kind of quibbled yesterday on the podcast when I said that this is... I'm going to do it again the, because I don't penal, agree with you. One of the most penal golf courses that these guys play on the, on the PJ Tour schedule. Not the most difficult, we see the winning score. It's 20 under par. It's not the most difficult. I'm talking about penal in terms of if you hit a shot offline, you're looking at either a bogey or a double real quick because the hazards, uh, because of the water, uh, because of the sand, uh, because of the muck, whatever the case may be. And I think that's kind of what popped up with Xander Shoffley. He missed his target, Rex, on, on 14 by a foot off the tee. So he was in the rough. Uh, he had a little bit of mud on it and was un unable to control it. And he missed the green by about a foot again and was in a really tricky spot and, uh, and unable to get up and down. 15T, flails it in the right bunker. Again, misses his target by about a, a, a couple of feet, ends up going left in really thick rough and is unable to get up and down. Just like that back-to-back -back bogeys that makes him have to then press uh, on the final three holes, which, you know, with so much danger that that has to be an uncomfortable feeling, but this was his golf tournament with eight holes to play. And, and we kind of previewed it on the podcast on Saturday night. I said, I'll be real curious to see how this new rebuilt swing with Chris Como stands up. And he's still doing a lot of rehearsals, trying to not get the club as, as laid off at the top and get a little more across the line. I think the early returns obviously are very, very promising. I mean, this was his fifth uh, top 10 of the PGA tour season. 
uh, the second most on the PGA Tour. Uh, his ball speed numbers are up, which was a, a main target for him. But it's still a work in progress. And I think the back nine in particular exposed some of the some of the deficiencies that it currently has. I think in a couple of months' time, once these changes with Chris Como are, are bedded in, uh, I think Xander is is poised to to really threaten you know the top three or four players uh, in the world. But as he sits here right now on Sunday night, this was certainly a golf tournament that that got away from him. Uh, just to clarify something right here, we kind of had to leave the media center tonight. We wanted to do this podcast as quickly as possible. So we had to leave the media center. So what we did is we came to the interview area, which is where I am, which is where you are. But they're breaking everything down. That's why there's so much chaos around us. So we apologize for all of the chaos, all of the noise, all of the movement behind us. Uh, I, I'm not going to play your word salad game on this one. Penal, difficult. It wasn't in the... the Those P are two entirely different PPC things. Sawgrass difficult wasn't even means hard. A U.S. Open traditionally is hard. That does not necessarily mean it is penal. Penal means there is a potential penalty for shots. It's literally in the definition. That is uh, the def and that is the exact definition is. of TBC Sawgrass. There's eight. There's water on 18 holes. It is no, a it's, penal. It's penal. I, I don't know that I agree that it's the most penal on tour. My guess is uh, the guys would kind of point out it's probably the one that messes with players' heads the most. Uh, uh, that's the way I would go with it. But to your point, I will say if you're messes with top, it's 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 just off the charts on messes with guys' heads. Is that, sure. Let's do that as strokes gain. Strokes gain messing <laughs> with guys' heads. Heads is heads. We did this earlier. Heads is. It's a fun game. Um, I will say that it messes with guys' heads. And a, a really good example, and I agree with your points on Xander, uh, I'm going to say that this is a step in the right direction. You're right. Xander's probably not getting on a plane tonight to, to fly home thinking to himself, wow, what a great week I had. No, I'm sure he's aggravated because anytime a PGA Tour player gives himself a chance to win and doesn't pull it off, that there's always going to be an empty feeling. But it is – I would say it's more than a step in the right direction that clearly you're right. He's still sort of still trying to figure some stuff out that whatever he and Chris Comer are working on, but to do it on this golf course with these conditions, with that leaderboard. And I do want to get into the, the this is as good as golf gets Sunday. Cause you and I have already kind of hashed this one out between the two of us. Uh, what I will say about TPC Sawgrass and the example that I saw out of Xander today was on the fourth hole. And he teed off the fourth hole, which isn't a terribly long hole, and it does demand some accuracy. But he teed off with a with a rescue wood, and he missed the fairway twenty yards to the right, almost went in the water hazard. Which most because that don't. fairway messes with guys' heads, heads, strokes gain, heads. Um, they, so there are some big misses in there, and yes, this golf course penalizes big misses. Maybe that's a better way of doing it. Stroke, it's stroke pe gain. It's a penal golf course. Penalizes. Like, can we just not agree that this I, is a penal I, golf course? I just don't like your word be, salad. This should, not, this should not be a controversial no. take. I, 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 don't, I just don't like your word salad. But yes, I, I'm sure he's aggravated. But when the sun comes up tomorrow and he heads back out to the range, I, I feel like he knows that he's headed in the right direction. And the things that he are doing, keep in mind, it's been a minute since he won on the PGA Tour. So there probably is something to be said for, and Rory has kind of touched on this in the past, that he almost needs to learn how to win a major again since it's been a decade. Well, it's been a minute for Xander. And so putting himself in a position like this where you had so many top players playing under these kind of conditions, it's probably a really good litmus test to let him know exactly where he is with his game. Speaking of Roy McIlroy, Rex, a, another forgettable Sunday, shot 72, ended up finishing in a tie for 19th. But I think more interesting was what Rory said afterward regarding the meeting uh, with the uh, PIF governor, Yasir al Rumayan, which the PGA Tour policy directors are scheduled to do on Monday here in Ponte Vedra. I'm sure you'll be scoping out the location as soon as this podcast oh, yeah. wraps. Me and you, were in, you were in that scrum. What did, you, what did Rory say and what did you take away from it? It was it was quintessential Roy. He was so on point. Uh, I asked him specifically, and and this is one of the deals. And I think we've talked about this before. I, I workshopped this question because I wanted to be very, like I was trying to get to a very specific answer, and he got to the answer that I didn't expect in a million years. I said, Rory has met with the governor of the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, uh, Yasser Al Ramayan. It's the first time I've done it on the podcast. Rushed Pulled it off, nailed it. Uh, well he's met with him before at the end of 2022. Must and be all that liquid question, courage. Yes. Uh, he met with him at the end of 2022. And I asked him, since you have been, you've met him, you know what his motivations are in golf are. What do you hope the players take from this meeting on Monday? And the answer went in a direction I did not expect. He started the answer with, he feels like that Live Golf and those who represent Live Golf, he specifically mentioned Greg Norman, the CEO of Live Golf, are not doing 
Piff any favors. He he his comment was he feels like they mi have misrepresented what yes called it, it a disservice a disservice and then he went on to say that uh, having the conversations with yasir he feels like he wants to get in the game for the right reasons and then when pressed a little bit more exactly what the public investment fund wants out of this he gave another really good answer about this is a sovereign wealth fund they want to be able to park their money his word not mine mm -hmm. park their money in safe businesses that are going to be around in a long time intelligent businesses and the pga tour is certainly one of those businesses it sort of opened my eyes to exactly what the motivations are because from Rory's perspective, and keep in mind, he hadn't talked the last two days, so I, I wasn't 100% sure he was even going to talk to the media today. He didn't have a particularly good round. He shot 72 on Sunday here at TPC Sawgrass. But the motivations here are clear. All along, he has been against Liv Goff. All along, he's been very much against Greg Norman. He's clearly made it personal. But when he made his heel turn and went to the other side as a result of June 6th and decided that, okay, that uh, some sort of merger between the PGA Tour and the Public Investment Fund is not only inevitable, it's probably good for the game. That he, he was kind of in an awkward position because it probably felt very hypocritical to a lot of people. But now that he made that distinction in his answer today, I, I sort of dissected it and kind of came to the conclusion that maybe he's right. I don't know. I've never met Yasir. I'm, my guess is I never will. But if that's truly the case, then it's a distinction that will serve the tour well. And I got I was a little surprised at some of the comments we got from the podcast the other night when we actually reported, we talked about the news that there is going to be a, a secret meeting on Monday. And I said that it was a positive step. A lot of people came at me about, is it a positive step that the PGA tour is going to get in business with murderers? I thought we'd move beyond oh, goodness. that conversation. My, oh, oh, yeah. oh, my goodness. Yes. I, I thought we'd move beyond that conversation. Apparently we have not. So I, I just want to say positive it. step so we can stop talking about this ad nauseum with zero progress. No, it's a positive step because so we could reunite the game. Because we can all agree, and this is a really good segue to where I wanted to take this conversation, we can all agree that where we are right now is not good for the game of golf. That a fractured game where you and I essentially roll our eyes every time someone mentions the world of golf ranking, because I think we both agree, nah, it's really not a very good measure of who the best players in the game are. And it's all because many, a lot of the best players are playing on a tour that's not getting world ranking points. What I, what I felt like it was a positive step is moving towards that. I'm not judging whether or not the tour should be in business with the public investment fund or not, but for the good of the game and to reunite the game, that's the only way to do it. But don't you think Rory has to be regretting his decision to leave the PJ tour policy board? Don't you think he's regretting that he's not going to be in that room? Don't you think he's not going to be part of the conversations with tiger and Cantlay and Peter Malnati and Webb Simpson and the like actually forging a path for the future of the PGA tour. His only platform right now is, is the one that we're providing him in the tournament flash area that you're sitting in right now being asked big, questions. It's a pretty big pl platform. To, to be it's, fair. A, it's a really it's big a, platform. It's, it's a big platform, but he cannot enact change. He is no, he is no longer in a position to directly enact change uh, on the PGA tour. He can certainly sway public opinion. And I think he's probably done a, a, a pretty good job uh, of doing that. But if he, is kind of aligned in his viewpoint with, with Yasir and he's met with Yasir and he understands what Yasir is doing. And there is some resistance on the PGA tour policy board as, as opposed to the, what the, the PIF might bring. Don't you think the PGA tour policy board is worse off if the best outcome is to partner with the PIF? Don't you think the PGA tour policy board is worse off without Rory McIlroy as an ally? I think the PGA tour policy board is probably worse off without Rory on it to be quite frank with you because i think he's a voice in the game that's important i think he having well having uh, the other six the six policy policy uh directors on the on the policy board uh, di uh player directors on the policy board right now have never met with any representatives from the public investment fund not even the governor rory being the only one that would have met i think he would have been a voice in the room that could have at least conveyed to the other player directors and the other independent directors exactly what the motivations might be of why they want to get in the game of golf i'm going to push back on the idea that he regrets decision twofold and and this is a little bit of inside baseball but and we had this conversation uh, right around the ssg deal when the pga tour announced that 
Roy McElroy is very, very close. He's an investor in Fenway Sports Group, and SSG is essentially being led by Fenway Sports Group and John Henry. It probably would have been a conflict of interest. Like that was sort of the conversation on the ground. We never got there because he resigned. I don't know if that was his primary motivation, but it was always going to be a little sticky. There was always going to be some questions there. There's also the idea that Rory would not have been able to stood, stood behind me right where I'm sitting right now tonight and fired those shots and made his public announcement uh, of how he wants to sort of sway that public opinion if he was on the policy board. Because as we representing the, last, the entirety of the membership, I can certainly understand that viewpoint. Because he, as we've learned over the last two days, that the players were terrified to talk about this. They clearly are up against it and realize that they can't say they can't give it an opinion. They try to keep everything to facts. Uh, Peter Malnati kind of talked himself into a pretzel <laughs> yesterday. I mean, it was a very long and rambling interview, and you can tell that he tried to say more and when he probably should have tried to say less. And I like Peter a lot. I'm not being overly critical here. Even Adam Scott, who I find is one of the most well-spoken and thoughtful players on the PGA Tour, he was just flummoxed when we sort of all jumped around him on Friday afternoon and, and hit him with the news that we hear there's a secret meeting on Monday. Thoughts, please. I, I think all of the player directors are under the thumb right now of not saying a word because they can't. Same reason Jake, uh, Jay Monahan, the commissioner, couldn't say anything on Tuesday in his press conference. This is an active, ongoing negotiation. And anything you say or do is going to impact those negotiations. Rory, on the other hand, is just a player. And he can get on the stage behind me and he can say whatever is in his mind and in his heart. And that's what he did today. I truly believe it. So, no, I disagree with you. He could not have done any of this on the policy board. So he's pet better off where he is right now. And and we, we've talked about this before, the idea that Tiger Woods is leading that policy board. Tiger Woods' voice is going to be the loudest voice in that room. So whatever happens on Monday, Tiger is going to be the one that ultimately decides how this plays out. We will, of course, send folks to NBCSports.com slash golf. Uh, for any sort of news, how much news, if any, are you expecting? When I talked to Patrick Cantlay uh, on Sunday here at TBC Sawgrass, he did not expect any su anything substantive from this meeting. Uh, he said it was kind of a meet and greet, uh, an informal icebreaker, if you will. But are you expecting any sort of memo to the membership, uh, kind of rehashing how it went, or will we just kind of get a, a, a slow uh, drip? Uh, and, and and some rumors from how the meeting actually went. What do you what do you what are you anticipating? Uh, plan B. Uh, the other side, the, the slow drip. I don't, yeah, the latter. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be any of that because, look, this is, as I said, and, and apparently uh, offended a lot of people. This is a positive step in the negotiations. Whether or not, if you agree that the tour should be in business with the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund or not, this is a positive step to get to some sort of deal. Along the line, I think it's an initial step. And so there's still a lot of things that have to be done. I think what this is, what this singles, what we can read into this is that they're far enough along in the process that they believe they can come up with some sort of deal that worked for everyone involved. Now the trick is convincing all of just not the player directors, but also the independent directors on the policy board that this is a good idea and you should vote for it. It's also worth po pointing out the new board of directors for PGA Tour Enterprises, which is the for-profit arm of the PGA Tour, they're scheduled to meet on Tuesday. So my guess is that the timing of this will be they want to they want to have this meet and greet. They want to be able to put a face to a name, which is the way. Wow, the wind is coming up. Uh, they want to be able to put a face to a name, which is the way um, Adam Scott, Adam Scott. described described the meeting. And then they want to go into the meeting on Tuesday and, and try to figure out where they are in the negotiations. But no, I wouldn't expect any news. Rex, we have three full weeks until the Masters and the year's first major. How will you look back, though, on this Players' Championship? It's a PGA Tours flagship event. The PGA Tours has never been in more turmoil than it is right now. Uh, so as your final thought, how will you remember the 2024 players? You and I talked about this. This is as good as it gets. I think there was four players out of the top 10, maybe five players out of the top 10, all kind of vying. For yeah, the but league. the OWGR sucks now. <laughs> uh, you're right. Am I, am, I, am I doing that right? Uh, I didn't check the data golf rankings. Maybe I should have done that. However it is you want to slice it, it had, had a, about as good of a leaderboard as you could have expected. Now, granted, Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas both missed the cut, but those things... Roy, were going Roy was a non-factor. Roy was a non-factor, so it, it could have gotten a little bit better. But what the tour delivered on Sunday the 50th Players' Championship, is pretty much as good as you can expect on, on, on a regular basis right now. 
And if the ratings are down again, like they were last week on Sunday at Bay Hill, then if you don't want to watch that, you're probably not a fan of golf. And I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying that one too. But that was that was compelling. I think both of us, you were texting me nonstop from the golf course. As a matter of fact, I wish I could kind of read some of them. But Great geez. sell signal here at TBC Sawgrass. Kudos to the PJ Tour uh, yeah. for running a tournament in which you don't just go into a black hole out of the golf course. You could actually keep up with what was happening. Kudos to the tour. Uh, I'd read some of those texts, but you got a little blue there towards the end. So I don't want, don't want to offend the audience on that one. That's as good as they get. So I'm really, really, normally I could care less about the ratings on Monday. But this one, I'm, I'm really curious on Monday to see exactly how this is going to compare to last year and previous years. Because I think this is a good litmus test of this is the product the tour can deliver. And is it going to be good enough for the public who clearly eh, has been sort of jaded by the idea that, there's this conflict in golf and you have the stars playing two different tours. And all we do is talk about money and mergers. It, was it good enough to override all those things? I would be curious. What, what's your t biggest takeaway? I had the exact same takeaway that I cannot I wait know. to see what the ratings are for this tournament, because would this tournament have been uh, enriched by having John Rahm and Cam Smith and Brooks Kepka and Dustin Johnson? Yes. And Joaquin Neiman. Yes. I think it's inarguable that that, would improve the tournament, but it's, it's especially at this golf course, it's, it's not a guarantee that they would have factored in the final result. And so to get what the PJ tour had, which was three of the top five players entering the day, at, at least, or no, let me, let me get this right. They had three players inside the top five at one point who were all T2 or better. And eventually you had four of the top 10 players in the world uh, in the mix for this title. Like, that's the best the PGA Tour can offer right now. Could you swap in a Speed? Could you swap in a Roy? Sure. But when I was walking around the golf course this afternoon, I said the the level of play is outstanding. We're seeing something from Scotty Scheffler ball striking wise that has not been done since Peak Tiger. You covered Peak Tiger. That was slightly before uh, I started on on the golf beat. Like it's extraordinary to watch Scotty Scheffler play golf. If you watch Wyndham Clark, you cannot help but be impressed uh, by how he launches it off the tee. Uh, and, and at least until today, kind of his tidiness on, on the greens. You cannot help but be awed by the completeness of Xander Shoffley's game or be uh, really optimistic about what Ludwig Oberg's future uh, looks like. You can still have the great stories, whether it's a Maverick McNeely who pops up uh, or a Nate Lassie who has come out of nowhere. Uh, like These are all stories that can still happen on the PGA Tour. Does it still resonate? Does it still matter? Has the last two years of conflict so badly damaged the the product, and has it so is it, has it turned off fans so much that they don't tune in for the shootout? I, I'm fascinated to see what the ratings are going to be because if if this doesn't work, if this didn't resonate, I, I fear that the tour model is broken, and this is what it's going to look like for the for the rest of the year ratings wise because this is this is quite frankly as good as it gets. No, you're absolutely right. And I'm, my my hope, my heart tells me that they are going, going to be better, at least year over year compared to what, where we were. I, I still feel that it's going to take a long time for the tour to sort of make up what they did, to, to, to fix this, what they did to not, – I'm not it's, talking about professional golf. I'm talking about what they did to the fans of professional golf because we hear it. Like, you and I walked around this golf course for four days, and I'm all, every fan wants to talk about the same thing. Like Roy said, this is not going to be an overnight – overnight solution like they're still going to be continuing down their path he mentioned the live contracts uh some of the big name players who had signed that initial waiver at least through the end of 2025 like like we're, we're going to be stuck in sort of this paradigm for the foreseeable future but i think the pga tour could go a long way in kind of extending the olive branch the pga tour fans and repairing that relationship by making some strides with the piff showing what a what a potential future could be because uh, right now they're, they're pissed off because some of their favorite players have gone. Uh, they've miscalculated kind of the the equation, thinking that, that fans actually care about how much money these guys are making and that money uh, it equates to significance, which was a, which a major, major miscalculation on their part. The product, the PJ Tour product, stood for itself on Sunday here at TPC Sawgrass. Uh, when it comes to the ratings and how, many, how much that resonates with fans, uh, it will be very interesting to see how much that still matters. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lav. It's getting dark at TBC Sawgrass. We still have plenty to write up on the website. So you guys know the drill, nbcsports.com slash golf for all of our latest 
news, notes, features, and commentary from the final round of the Players Championship. I'll be on vacay, enjoying the last oh, adult going? break with my wife in Puerto Rico. Rex, of nice. course, will be delivering all the news and notes from this private meeting with Yasir Al Rumayan on Monday in the board meeting on Tuesday. I think we're also scheduled to have a fill-in guest on the Golf Channel podcast with Rex and T. Lou on That's Wednesday, true. potentially, news if that me. comes to fruition. But Rex and I will also be on Golf Today for our usual roundtable on Monday. Thank you guys so much for listening, not just to the preview podcast on Wednesday, but to each and every one of the mini podcasts that we've been pumping out from Players Championship Week. It seems like you guys are really enjoying them. We certainly enjoy doing them and chopping it up with you guys. So as always, thanks for listening. We'll be back in a few days. Thank you guys. See you soon.